Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Tony Pace Carstensen, and I'm chair of the LA section of the VES Vision Committee. And on behalf of the VES, I would like to welcome all of you to today's event. But first of all, I want to thank some of the people who made this event possible. The first person I'd like to thank is Jackie Morey, who's vice president. <laughs> Vice President of Education for Upload. I'd also like to thank Greg Catano, who's the founder of Hologate, and Paul Heineck, who is the CFO of Upload. And one more person I'd like to thank is Shannon Gans. Shannon. <laughs> Because it was Shannon Gann's idea to do this event. So thank you, Shannon. We're all here, and it's all your fault. <laughs> and now I'd like to, I would like to introduce our moderator, Jeff Barnes. Uh, yes, Jeff Barnes. Jeff Barnes is the executive vice president of studio operations of Lightfield Lab in Silicon Valley, where they have been developing ultra-high-resolution holographic production technologies. Jeff was previously executive director of studio productions at Lytro, where among other things, he produced the world's first light field created short film. Wow, thank you. For over 25 years, Jeff has been a production executive at the center of the industry's leading visual effects studios. He was vice president of visual effects and stereo productions at Digital Domain, CEO and co-founder of the award-winning visual effects studios, Cafe FX, and The Syndicate. Some of the projects his teams produced for VFX include Alice in Wonderland, Iron Man, Pan's Labyrinth, and the Harry Potter ride for Universal theme parks. Jeff is past chairman of the Global Visual Effects Society and was named one of the top 200 creative people in the world by Entertainment Weekly. Please join me in welcoming Jeff Barnes. Thanks, Tony. Thanks for the intro. Can everybody see okay? Hear okay? All the way in the back back there? Well, thank you for coming today on a Sunday. We're really excited to have this panel for you. Uh, Shannon, thanks for the, uh, the brainchild of coming up with this. Um, we're extremely fortunate to have a really impressive and diverse group of panelists here today. Uh, we're going to be learning from their uh, experience in visual effects and VR, and how those backgrounds can help us translate from visual effects to virtual reality. The goal of this presentation is to provide you with some thought-provoking discussion on the viabilities of working in the virtual reality space. The panel will give you some unique insights on where your skills as a VFX practitioner may be best utilized with these developing new mediums. We will continue to concentrate on, well, no, we will concentrate on VR post workflows today, uh, working with real-time engines, exploring the various post roles and how they may translate from uh, VFX to VR, and touch on some of the developing new tools and experiences being created to help make your projects more cost-effective and streamlined. Each panelist will first be giving a short overview, about 10 minutes apiece, of their most recent VR-related project and concentration. Uh, we will then convene for a 40-minute sit-down discussion up here and um, rib each other a little bit. And then as time allows, uh, hopefully about 10 minutes left, we'll take some audience Q&A. All right, anybody have any questions? Are we all excited? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so first up, uh, Craig Barron. I'm just going to read through their bios real quick, and then we'll kind of circle back around and have them come back up. All right. So Craig is basically one of the icons of our industry. Uh, it's true, Craig. It's true. Uh, he began his career at uh, ILM, where he worked on such classics films as The Empire Strikes Back. Raiders of the Lost Ark, and E.T. the Extraterrestrial. His visual effects company, Matt World Digital, conjured environments for such films as Titanic, Zodiac, Alice in Wonderland, and Hugo, which won the Academy Award that year. Craig received an Oscar nomination for his work on Batman Returns, 
and an Academy and an Oscar for Best Visual Effects for The Curious Case of Benjamin Buttons. Craig is co-chair of the Science and Technology Council of the Academy and an Academy governor representing the visual effects branch. His most re recent project, where I believe he directed uh, Blade Runner 2049, the memory lab sequence, it was a VR sequence, it's excellent, I was playing it the other night, I'm stuck, as I told you, I need your help to get out of it. Uh, <laughs> uh, created in a partnership with Alcon uh, Interactive Group and Oculus VR. We're really honored to have you here, Craig. Thanks for coming. Uh, next is the very talented Richard Kidd. Richard and I have known each other for a few years. We've gone out a time or two. I won't talk about that. Um, but after 20 years as a director producer in film to entertainment, Richard formed uh, Perilous Orbit to create VR, AR projects that push the limits of these emerging technologies. Perilous Orbit's first project, Sports Bar VR, which was originally entitled Pool Nation VR, um, was a smash hit on uh, uh, HTC, Valve, uh, Oculus Touch, and PlayStation VR. Richard has managed and supervised visual effects work for some of the industry's top directors, producers, and projects. He formed and oversaw the team that generated the ocean water in James Cameron's Titanic. He then teamed up with the Wachowskis to design and break down the VFX for the 1999's visually stunning The Matrix. He has multiple award-winning collaborations with top industry leaders such as Robert Zemeckis, uh, Lorenzo de Bonaventura, uh, Catherine Hardwick, and others. Richard is a former member of the Visual Effects Society Board of Directors and, the Noman School of Visual and on the Noman School of Visual Effects Advisory Board. Richard also holds a BS in Computer Engineering from the University of Florida, and we are really excited to have you here today. Thanks, Richard. Uh, let's see, and last but not least, the amazing Mariana Acuna. Uh, I recently met Mariana, like we'd met before, but I recently got to know her a little bit better. This woman is a dynamo, <laughs> if you haven't met her before. Um, Mariana is a technologist, connector, and entrepreneur. During her years at the Foundry, she was focused on virtual reality post-production workflows using Nuke, as well as being the head of product, product specialist in the Americas. Mariana was a producer in her, a pioneer in her hometown of Mexico City, where she founded the first VR and 360 video production and branding agency, Jolt VR. Most recently, she co-founded Opaque Studios, where she leads the roadmap for new and existing technology, developing tools for VR production using virtual and augmented reality, transforming the way filmmaking is done today. She has some really interesting things to share with us on that today. Mariana has enjoyed multiple speaking engagements, either as a panelist or moderator. Prior to her switch into tech, she worked as an on-set VFX soup and digital artist for over 13 years for companies like Imageworks, CIS, Digital Domain, HBO, Columbia Pictures, and Fuse FuseFX. She was also recently named one of the top 10 virtual reality, reality innovators to watch by Variety Magazine. That's pretty cool. Mariana, we are thrilled to have you here. And we can't wait to dive into some of your tech. <laughs> All right, now on to the presentations. Um, Mr. Barron, would you grace the stage first here? Please? Thank you. Thank you. Um, just give me a second here to switch over to Okay, so um, Blade Runner 2049 Memory Lab. I want to talk a little bit about this today. Uh, I've been working at Magnopus for almost four years now. I used to work in the visual effects industry. Now we're more concentrated on AR and VR. Um, this is a whole sort of new area to tell stories. And one of the things that I wanted to do on this particular film, or rather this VR experience, was because there was a film that was released, we wanted to try to make it as cinematic as possible, so the art direction was going to be keyed off of what um, was trying to be uh, depicted in the film as far as creating Los Angeles in 2049. 
Uh, I have a little trailer, so I thought maybe I'd just show that to give you a sense of the art direction and a look of the uh, experience. Would it be possible to turn off the lights back there just for the trailer? Is that okay? And then I'll, uh, I'll show it to you and come back and talk about it. Alexa? No. <laughs> <laughs> Will the, uh, so, should I? There we go. Okay. okay. Oh, great. And it even fades out. How nice. Okay, here we go. I've never met a Blade Runner before. Welcome to your memory. Something's wrong. You're in a different memory. Don't worry. We made you. We'll take care of you. Okay. That was the quick version. So, okay. So the idea, of course, is we're wanting to create this sort of cinematic look, and we were able to work with the production, so a lot of the assets we could share. Um, we, of course, had to take those uh, and decimate them to run in VR, but a lot of sort of the design was established um, by the film. Uh, so we call these experiences, so like, you know, if you, a regular uh, AAA computer game is going to take maybe three years to, to produce and create. The experiences that we're doing for VR are around uh, six to eight months, okay, they're much, and they're much smaller, so they're not quite as ambitious on what, a, uh, what an actual computer game would be. But one thing I wanted to try to do in this was that, um, while I think it's acceptable when you play computer games that you have CGI humans, um, a lot of times, in something that should be more cinematic, we were looking for a solution that uh, could get us around, you know, the classic uh, Uncanny Valley <laughs> issue of where, um, you know, there's, there's realism and at a certain point if you get almost but not quite to a uh, human CGI character looking realistic, it produces a sort of revulsion or uneasiness. And I think that's acceptable in computer games, but for this, because it had a tie into a cinematic movie, we were really looking for another solution to populate our characters. So we ended up using the um, hollow, um, the hollow capture technique of, um, from uh, Microsoft, where we use real actors in this case, but we photograph them in an array of cameras, I believe there's 108 cameras, both as RGB cameras and um, IR to capture the uh, character as a performance. But because you have so many cameras, you can then move any direction as, as that asset essentially is captured as a file that you can look at from any direction. And this is a very strange surrealistic 2D aspect of these maps. And when you play this, it's really weird because the character's talking in this flat 2D surface, which then gets projected uh, onto the IR geometry. I can show you a little example of that. So, um, so it's, it's photographed just like a take, just like you would have a, a normal camera, there's more of them. And then you capture this performance as a 3D asset. Okay. Just as these are another uh, couple examples of this particular character was uh, supposed to be holographic as well, similar to the holographs that, or holographic characters that were in the movie. So we were very confident that if she shimmered a little bit and we could edit her performance, of course, that was just part of the art direction of the sequence. So as I said before, that since she's an asset, she's playing back and you are dimensionally able to view her from any direction. Uh, so you can drop one of these characters into a 3D environment and walk around them and view them from any angle as they're doing their performance. So I started with the idea of, okay, I'm gonna have to light this for every environment to make sure that the, there's interaction. But what we ended up doing was um, just capturing the asset in an ambient way and then adding light in a post-production process. So you can see that since we have geometry on these characters, we can then post-light them to make them fit into the environment as necessary. 
And then this is just an example of where she was backlit by some light sources and we put then uh, back rim light on her shoulder so that she would be integrated into the scene. Okay, so um, I've only talked for five minutes and 33 seconds, but <laughs> I didn't know exactly how long that you guys wanted to talk, but I think in general, um, my overview of this is that um, uh, there's a lot of emerging technologies that we can take advantage of, and uh, there's no one way to do anything at this point. It's kind of the Wild West as far as um, how we can kind of create a story or tell a story and uh, creating a tools or vocabulary to talk in this new medium I think is really fascinating. So uh, from somebody that's been a visual effects practitioner for many years, uh, I'm very engaged by this process. I think it has a lot of uh, possibilities and uh, it should be an interesting uh, sort of career choice to venture out into because it's very similar to uh, filmmaking. It's just kind of in a different medium. So I guess that's it for the short term. Richard, let me help you. Okay. There you go. Perfect. Thanks so much, Craig. Uh, so Tony has assured me that the fastest one wins a jet ski. So I'm going to do really hard to beat. I'm um, do my best to beat 533. Um, all right, first, uh, Parallax Orbit, as, as um, they mentioned previously, is the company they founded um, about two years ago. Um, and uh, we're a, basically a VR, AR company. We're in the game space, and, and some things that, like Craig touched on, we'll sort of talk about is this, this industry is so new right now, we're sort of evolving the vocabulary um, of the industry. So, for example, experiences or game, we really call ours uh, a, a VR experience. And the reason we do that is because you don't have to play a game in the experience. Um, I think 90% of what, if not 99% of what you're seeing currently are video games with head-mounted displays, not virtual realities. You don't think after 20 minutes that you were actually on this platform shooting droids um, in space. You had an amazing time and you, you know, it's mind-blowing video game play and extremely immersive you really feel immersed in this game, but you don't necessarily think you were actually there and could do anything other than shoot droids. Um, so I say that because that's what really, we're sort of, we're not a game company, we're a VR AR company. We just know right now that's where the commercial market is, is the only sort of real market is in gaming um, and or VR experiences. Um, and so that's what we do. A Pool Nation was the original game. I'll go, oh, I'll get to that in a sec, but just to quickly, just about me, just so, we didn't know we have such amazing, glowing uh, uh, reviews ahead of time, so I don't know much else to say. Um, worked on Titanic, The Matrix, What Lies Beneath, Castaway, and Twilight were some of the bigger projects I worked on. Um, I'm on the advisory board for the University of Florida Digital Worlds Institute, which was started about 20 years ago. Actually, um, I started that um, when, uh, with, in conjunction with the president of the university, because that's where I went to school, um, when I was working at Digital Domain at the time, and I was like, hey, we're trying to hire all these people that know digital technology and are artists and can create these digital worlds and they don't exist. Um, and so the program's been going for about uh, 17 years now. They've had their, their first students through there. Um, and um, so uh, they have a graduate, full graduate program and everything. Um, really neat program. Uh, as I mentioned, former board member of the VES, Noman. I worked at, started at Vision Art Design and Animation, if some of you guys remember that name, if you're old enough, uh, you may. Uh, and then it was the Digital Domain, Cinesite, and Sony were some of the companies that I worked at. Um, so on to Perilous Orbit and what we've done, um, some of the milestones. We released um, basically May 31st, Ju uh, June 1st of 2016. Um, we then were a launch partner with uh, Sony, so October 13th. Um, when PlayStation VR launched, we launched on PlayStation VR. Um, and we launched as Sports Bar VR because in the intervening months from, from June to October, we had gone from a game that was uh, pool-centric, it was a sort of a bar space that had you could play pool in, to at that time you could play um, air hockey, darts, chess, checkers, shuffleboard, and ski ball, well, not ski ball, ramp ball, excuse me, Trade, no trademarks infringed. Um, so ramp ball. So we um, 
you could play all of those games. So at that point, we really decided we had been changing things and adding so much more to it. And people were like, oh my gosh, I don't like to play pool. And we were like, well, it's not just about pool. So, and some people just get into play ramp ball or they just like to throw darts. So we changed the name. Um, December uh, 6, uh, for uh, when Oculus Touch was released, um, we launched alongside that. We were a launch partner with Oculus Touch. Um, we also did all the custom integration for their avatar, the avatar system for Oculus uh, for UE4. They had never done, um, uh, they, they had been developing it for Unity and we were in UE4, so they came to us and asked us. So we did all the original code for them for that. So we have a great relationship with Oculus. Um, we then, in, on Steam on December 11th, um, we upgraded the Pool Nation game to the full sports bar game, uh, free of charge to all our users. Um, and then last year, just this last year, November 30th, we upgraded all of them to Sports Bar VR 2.0, which means now we have cross-play on all platforms. So we made the, the map bigger. You can now play on any of the pool tables in the game. There's like seven of them, I think, now. Um, and a eight ball, nine ball, killer. You can play multiple, you know, four people can play the game at the same time. Four people can play um, a single game of pool all together as a team. Um, and you can have up to eight people in your bar at a time from all around the world. Um, so that's sort of what I was talking about before is an experience. You can just go, we've, we find people that aren't into gaming, they'll get into the game and they'll actually play, um, they'll just throw smash bottles, throw chairs around and they'll just goof off for 20 minutes and they're just having a blast and they're like, well, don't you want to play some pool? You know, they'll take it off and come out and I'm like, well, do you want to play some pool? And they're like, oh, no, 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 that was good. I, I had a blast. So. That's, you know, that's the, that's the whole point is, is an experience. You might just go to talk to people and go hang out. Early on, we heard people at tech companies were going in just to have conference calls um, because they're like, why do it another way? Like, I'm hanging out having a beer while I'm talking to you, you know, a virtual beer. Um, I was, this is the trailer of the game. I'll show you the game. So. So those are the hats and stuff that you wear, you can see the different players. So you can see there's lots of other crazy stuff in there too. We have a ping pong gun and all kinds of craziness. And there's the hats, the hats that you saw, the crazy burger hats and chicken hats. That's all stuff you can win and unlock in the game just to have fun. Um, there's customized cue sticks as well. Um, this is just some of the things that were said when we first came out. This is actually was pool, just Pool Nation. Um, the game that convinced me of the immersive qualities of the Vive was Rock, Paper, Shotgun. Um, we also, you know, VR Focus, um, some great stuff. I'll just breeze through this so we don't have to. You can take a look. Um, but we got a lot of great reviews and people were just like blown away by how immersed you could get into this environment. Meaning, um, you'd go in and you'd be playing pool. You'd be playing pool with someone. And uh, when you're playing pool with them, you would actually move out of the way of the other person who's walking around the table and of course they're 3,000 miles away from you on the east coast or even in you know in in England um, but you just feel like you're in their space and it's just amazing immersion um, just some of the stories of our company uh, we made over a million in revenue in the first six months uh, we had 25 percent saturation on Steam VR when it first came out um, with the first title to uh, ever break Steam's top 10 sellers list, um, VR title. So we were in the top 10 games of all games on Steam um, as a VR title. Uh, we were a top 10 seller on PlayStation VR when we um, launched in 2016. Um, we were bundled with uh, NVIDIA graphics cards, overwhelming positive rating on Steam. So we still have an over 90% rating. I think we're pretty close to 95, if not still 95. Um, we were originally like 98%. Um, uh, that gave us positive reviews. So that's like amazing. We're super happy. Um, and lots of people viewing their content. And we've made number one post on Reddit before. So um, 
future VR. A lot of people are talking about what's the future of VR and what's going on. Um, I just say, you know, I, I think it's pretty clear. Um, I think the commitments uh, of money is there. I think obviously the hardware needs to grow up, um, and that's just going to take time for it to for the adoption. Um, but the reality is today's VR is the internet of the 90s. VR is not going to go away. Um, it's, it's not a fad. It's not like 3D. There's, there's none of the parallels that you can make there, although people try. Um, just a couple quotes from Zuckerberg. Um, next major computing platform, he said at OC3 in 2016. And he said this year in 2017, we want to get a billion people in virtual reality. I mean, I think it's, you know, to me, saying virtual reality, saying is that going to succeed or not, that's like saying is the, is the computer monitor going to succeed. Um, it's not it's not a question I mean it's just a matter of when why would I have six computer monitors at my desk when I can put on one lightweight headset and, and eventually it won't even be a headset it'll be some little button I flip down and a little screen drops in front of my face why would I what I would why would I have six monitors that I got to carry with me um, some of the important skills tools that we use um, unreal oh I have 30 seconds dang I'm not gonna win the jet ski um, Unreal, we're actually in Unreal Engine, of course there's Unity as well, um, we use Visual Studio as a development environment we use for compiling everything. Um, PlayFab is one of the APIs that we use um, for everything from analytics, but it's all in-game functionality, so everything that you win and unlock and stuff like that, we keep track of that in PlayFab, um, as opposed to on the individual platform, so that way you can take your user profile with you wherever you go. Um, obviously, Maya is used for all the 3D modeling stuff. We use Google Analytics for a lot of stuff, keeping track of all our users. Cognitive 3D is, um, is basically like Google Analytics for VR. Um, basically, you can check gaze. You can see where people are looking within game. You can see how much time they're spending in a certain area of the game. So it's very um, 3D oriented. Um, Hack and Plan is really great. Uh, game development, uh, it's basically like Trello meets you know, you know, uh, Jira. Um, which is sort of, uh, you know, good planning software. Um, and of course, we use Slack, for those who don't know who it is. Um, that's it. That's who we are. So thanks very much. That would be Mariana. Oh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here on a Sunday. So, and thanks to Jeff for all the awesome introduction. So I'm not going to talk about the past. Let's talk about the present and the future. So just so that it's no confusion out there, so I'm originally from Mexico City, I, I, although I would consider myself a total Angelino now, nine years here. Thank you, LA. So I have started working in VR since 2013. I was in a tech festival in Australia. I played a game, which is now huge, Sir Lindsay. And I was like, oh my god, this is just what I want to do, and this is going to change the world. So I knew that in Mexico City, my hometown, there was definitely nobody going to be doing virtual reality. So I opened up Joel VR uh, with uh, another person in Mexico City, my VR producer, who is another amazing lady. And we basically just concentrated in doing 360 video and branded our original content. So for example, you know, you could brand your cardboard and then use, we would do your 360 video, right? And then you would go on events and things like that. Now, I wanna make it very clear. I opened that just to be a pioneer in my hometown because I knew I wasn't gonna make any money doing that in Mexico City. So just, 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 just to make clear that point. And if anybody wants to see one of the short films that we created, it was a, in a few VR festivals. It's up there in the Gear VR on, a, you know, it's a mobile Gear VR and it's called Etienne, so you can watch that, which is from Jolt. Now, moving on to, oh, and this, these are also some slides from uh, some uh, work that we've done at Jolt, so that's a music video that it's, uh, it's still in post-production because it's pretty hard, it's kind of like Kyle Minogue's Welcome to My World, so there's, you know, a, a lot of things happening in the scene. This is Etienne, that is indeed a sheep, and that is the, the short that you can watch upstairs. And then finally down there were the first like VR in-engine in um, titles for a film festival, for a tech festival. So now on to Opaque Studios, which is now uh, my full-time job with my awesome co-founder that's here, best co-founder ever, Norman, woohoo! Uh, who's, who's the one to convince me to go into this crazy adventure with him. Uh, we have offices in Melbourne, uh, a mini office in Taiwan and Los Angeles, and when I did this, I actually forgot to put that. We also have an office in Germany, that's where most of our developers are. Uh, 
So what do we do? Before I jump into exactly what do we do at Opaque Studios, I just, just in case anybody in the audience does not know what virtual production is, basically virtual production is just like something that gives filmmakers something tangible they can touch and interact with. So if you guys remember James Cameron back in the day, Avatar, which was a huge hit how he made it and all this new technology he was using, right? So that's virtual production. Now, this is, I wanted to put just a little bit of kind of like a timeline of how, how it's gone down. So Final Fantasy, of course, Polar Express, Beowulf in 2007, Avatar in 2009, Tintin 2011, and of course Jungle Book 2017, which won, has won several awards now in virtual cinematography. Now, it didn't take on uh, back in the day of James Cameron, well, mainly because that A, the technology was not there, and B, because, you know, if you say Avatar, James Cameron, the one thing that comes to your mind is ding, 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 expensive, dollar bill, dollar bill, too many dollars, too many dollars. So, you know, people used to think that it was crazy expensive, so they would not even touch it with, you know, like, don't, don't go anywhere near it. But now, thanks to virtual reality and also to game engines, this has completely changed. So what we're doing at Opaque Studios is basically we are building tools for virtual production, real-time production, and we're using virtual reality. We have a little bit of AR happening on the side as well, but we're using virtual reality as a visualization tool. And what that means is it's just like, you know, back in the day, Video Village, well, now you, just, now you have VR, which means that taking it one step further, you can be immersed inside of your scene and you can actually start to take decisions real-time, which really, you know, cuts back on the waste, a lot of the waste that happens in VFX and gives content creators of all kinds, the ability of just take better decisions faster, you know, and be a lot more creative and concentrating what they're good at instead of, you know, instead of not being able to visualize anything because it's like just a green screen room and an actor or, or you know, a mock-up stage with a guy in a motion capture suit. So they, they can actually see what's happening. So. We have three tools. Um, at the end of this, you can also see, we didn't do the virtual reality setup because it would have taken a little bit longer of time that we had, but we, you can see Norman out there when we're, uh, when we're finished with the panel, if you want to see some of the tools and how they work with one of our mobile solutions. So we have three tools right now. One is out in the market. It's uh, called Phaseware Live, and that does yeah, you know, real-time facial uh, capture. Uh, facial live and, and body capture, and that's what our good, really good friend Addison is doing there. He, you know, he's checking the performance of the actor, and it is used in most recently in Altered Carbon, which we're very proud of. And you know, the people like other companies that use it at Disney, Hasbro, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we're we're very we're very happy where this is all going. Uh, for example, this is just um, an, an example of the amount of money that you can save on a shot when you're doing real-time production. The other tools that we have um, that you're not going to see them here, however, if you are serious about it, you can come to our office in LA and we'll give you the full demo. We have a tool called VDT, Virtual Director's Toolkit, which you can think about it just like a Google Docs for game engines. So, you know, a DP, a cinematographer, and the director can be all in different locations and they can collaborate in, inside of virtual reality and take decisions about lightning, virtual location scouting, asset reviewing. They can build a whole world around them, you know, get the sense of scale, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, the, the tool that we, that Norman is actually showing here is called VCam, so that's um, a virtual camera. And basically, we're, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you a short at the very end, but a virtual camera, well, we're just giving you the exact same presets that you would in a physical camera so that filmmakers don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? So you have all the lens packages, the film back presets, everything that you would do with a normal camera in the real world, but we give it to you in the game engine and we give you also the option to either shoot from inside virtual reality with a viewfinder, so very meta. Uh, we also give you the option of doing it through the iPad or for like B-roll, V-cam, et cetera, et cetera. Or you can just use an actual, you know, physical virtual device so that you can see your environment and your scene. So this in, you know, in this is I think with the times that we started to talk about it, Norman and I. So Seagraph 2015, we did the first real-time in-engine full-body facial mock-up demo, and we have continued to drive this real-time innovation in many other virtual production technologies like virtual cameras and simulcam. And that's the short uh, called uh, Boy and His Kite, and you can see it in Epic's 
uh, in Epix website. Uh, and as you know from like previous GDC, this is gonna get super big. You know, this is just gonna get on uh, bigger and better. And we really wanna democratize the tools for content creators of all, ty of all types and also for game developers to create VR experiences, short films, etc. So the third floor, there have been the best partners, our first, custom our first customers, and they have just been amazing in validating and production proving our tools. So that's part of the team. Basically, this is what we want to do. We just want to grow teams and create the tools for a global content revolution. And since I still have some time, yay, I'm going to show you, it's not in VR, but basically I'm going to show you a short that we did uh, with the third floor using our tools. Basically, we shot it in just one afternoon, but from ideation to completion to s took six weeks, which as you know, from in visual effects, six weeks, you're probably in version 96 because the smoke's still not poppy or not dense enough or something or other, right? So this from start to completion, from ideation to completion took only six weeks. And this short that you're gonna see, we did it in one afternoon. And this is to bring people, see the demo, and then be able to do edits and have different dailies as they're doing the demos. And it's called the Green Wedding. Give me sex. All right, let's get the change of culture, change of culture. I know you're some toy crazy. Man. <laughs> it's time a toast to the bride and groom. <laughs> Stop. She can't marry him. That man is an alien. That's how he can invent all these machines. I have proof. Look! God, please! This is my wedding! Time to leave, friend. And this guy, he's an alien too. This is a disguise. I will prove it. No! Let go! No, honey, don't. No, honey, okay. Uh, 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 okay. Uh,
and, and just to finalize, n everything that you saw, like nothing was beautified, cleaned up, or anything like that. Like basically, all the animation data that you're seeing, all of it was like straight. We didn't we straight from like the mockup shoot into the game engine. You know, using our tools with collaboration with the third floor. We did not want to do anything to it, just to showcase how powerful these new ways of creating content really is. And also like you have all the effects from the game engine already free of charge, right? They're already in there. And that, you know, the, the way that it looks, which is pretty awesome, that's also just like part of the game engine. So just to reiterate, there were no visual effects being done on the making of this short film. Thank you.